Welcome to the Enlighten Up Podcast, where I am going to take you into a deep exploration of what it means to exist in this current reality. We are going to raise your vibes, open your mind, expand your heart, and dive deep into the wondrous mysteries and possibilities of this lifetime. There's been a spiritual catalyst that has set in motion the awakening process of many across the globe to return to the knowingness of self and unite what has been separated. Together, we're going to bring light into that darkness. We're going to remember the joy of living. But most of all, we're going to turn up the volume of our own eternal power and do the thing we're here to do. back to the Enlighten Up podcast, everyone. I'm super excited to bring you a brand new guest to the show. I mentioned him last week on last week's episode. And today I am introducing you all to Luis Solis. He is the founder of Full Expression and he is an evolution catalyst. He evolves leaders and businesses into their greatest expression. And he believes in heart-centered leadership, which I'm an absolute fan of. When he works with clients and businesses, though, he redirects them straight into their greatness, which lies already within him. He is not about giving the answers to you. He is about helping you find the answers that lie within. Luis, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Thank you, Nicole. This is so much fun. This is so cool. Having watched in the audience to what you do, it's so fun to kind of be inside the box, inside the monitor and contributing to it. So I'm happy to do this and um, perhaps share some insights, um, a story that will help others uh, express themselves ever more fully. Yeah, I think we, you know, when we were chatting over dinner last week and you shared your story with me for the first time, you had never actually shared the story you're going to share today with me. Uh, I found it so compelling and you really like, I felt drawn into you and, and really where, why you are here in this moment, doing what you're doing right now. And a lot of us go through very pivotal changes that completely transform the trajectory of our lives. And it really speaks to this idea that there's so much more we can still do if we find ourselves feeling stuck or in a rut or maybe not sure where to turn next. Things can get a little stale. So why don't we go straight into it? Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's do that. And just to amplify, you can find full expression on the web, F-U-L-L X expression. Uh, full expression is all about guiding, inspiring and guiding really successful people to uh, uncover, claim and evolve their innate life purpose. And you may say, well, isn't that what they've all been doing? Well, that's what I also thought. And that's what this story today is all about. I thought I was living my life purpose. And it turns out as my story will share with you, uh, I've gone very far from where I was to new places, new experiences, new opportunities. Um, and, and it's what I, I love to do for others as well. Um, you're, all of you are probably familiar with, uh, whether it's Disney uh, or other movies that have this little uh, hero's journey type uh, of pattern to them. There's nothing wrong with that. It's used very heavily, but I'm neither a hero nor, and this is one of my points today, nor is this a linear journey. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I'm sharing with you today is how curvy linear, nonlinear, um, absolutely interrupted these last four or five years have been for me. There, there have been anything but linear. And when I've actually understood that there were almost moments when time stopped, time accelerated, time slowed down, I've come to really appreciate the beauty of, of just accepting life as it is and not worrying too much about the pace, the cadence, and nor worrying about, does it all make sense? Because it often makes no sense. And it's us humans who try to create this linear journey story, which really is not there. So let me just start out and help you join me in this story in the following way. You've heard about the Galapagos. They are 
directly, directly west of Quito, Ecuador, virtually on the equator line, if you look at a map, uh, almost 2,880 miles from Boulder. Okay, this is pretty far away, going all the way down there. My son, and this is, uh, this is in 2019, my son, uh, Sebastian, my older son, uh, happened to be uh, volunteering at an indigent uh, grammar school teaching, in Spanish teaching PE and some other classes for a couple of months. And he called me and said, hey dad, uh, in two weeks I wrap up my program and my Aussie mates went and did the Galapagos without me. And now I'm here and I'm coming back in two weeks. Would you consider doing it? Well, what you don't know is that I was in, at the time, my 25th month of a totally debilitating depression here in Boulder in my bedroom, often not leaving the house in periods of three to five weeks. I would order in food, ordering groceries. I was terrified to be outdoors. And here he is calling me and he knew me quite well. He knew how I was doing. In fact, he is one of the most precious spirit family members in my family. My son is a true spirit family member along with my father and my grandmother and a few others which I've come to uncover in this journey. And I think he was calling me there specifically because he knew what was possible for me. I didn't. So I'm in my 25th, 26th month of debilitation. And I think about it and I think, well, let's see. Um, I have nothing on my calendar any day of the week. I don't leave the house. I barely see the sunshine. I've heard the Galapagos are pretty cool. I have money. And candidly, I've been considering not being alive for so many months. I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to do that, someday anyway, kind of not be alive. I may as well see this first. Literally took it as a joke. And the synchronicities, the messages that would help me become better and cure me and push me along the future started right away because the first thing I did was say, well, you know, Sebastian, let me check out. Let me check out if there are any cruises available. You're saying when? He said next week. And I'm thinking, don't people plan this six and 12 months ahead of time like Galapagos? And he was like, oh, don't worry about it, just try. So I do, and after calling four or five times, I reach an operator who says, are you really serious about doing this? And I'm like, sure, sure I'm serious about doing this. And he's like, well, funny you should call. If you two can be on the boat next Wednesday, this is like a Friday, imagine this is a Friday. If you can be on the boat next, on the yacht next Wednesday, I'll give you two for one. And I'm going like, two for one, no, that's too good. Like, what does the boat look like? He shows me a picture. It is a magnificent yacht. And he says, the bonus is, just so you know, Brad Pitt and Ange Angelina Jolie rented this boat just for themselves four years ago. It's really a cool ship. And it's eight of you and there's 14 staff. What do you think? Two for one. I'm like, that's not very hard to understand. I'm coming. <laughs> Sign us up. So literally with almost no notice, within a day of my son calling, I'm heading to Ecuador to get there on Sunday. Cruise starts Wednesday. And I get into Quito, I don't know, Sunday night, Monday morning. And up till this point in time, over these months, I had struggled. I mean, verily struggled to get out of bed any sooner than 11 a.m., noon, 1 p.m. I had no energy, no life force to literally function. It's a situation. If you've been there, if you've heard of it, it's real. It is impossible to describe how one could be there, but I was there. So I fully expected, I said to him, well, but you know, sir, like what time does this cruise leave? Like, I'd like to start at 1 p.m. And he goes, oh, no, 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 you're Wednesday morning, 7 a.m. Like, you gotta be there. I'm like, I'm already panicked. Like, how will I do this? I don't wake up at that hour. But anyhow, I go to Quito, land late at night, Sunday night. Monday morning, I wake up without an alarm at this little Airbnb near the airport, 6.30 a.m. And I look around and I truly think it's a joke. Like, who is doing this? Like, how am I awake? How am I functioning? I walk and I shower, I get a cup of coffee and I go, well, it's a flu. Anything could happen one day. This is not who I am. I know it's coming back. And I did not feel well. I mean, there was ambient depression, anxiety all day long, but let's get going. And I ended up meeting my son, we spent one day in, um, you know, Monday night in Quito formally because I'd been at the airport and the same thing, Tuesday morning. 
I'm, I'm awake 7 a.m. at 6.45 and I have sufficient energy to go to breakfast. No kidding, haven't done this for over two years right now. And I'm starting to think like, this is a little weird. There's something strange going on that I, I well, you know, lightning could strike twice. Like, who knows? It, it's okay. I'm just going to go with it. And you get, the, you get the rhythm. We end up on the boat on Wednesday. I am not feeling particularly well most days. Um, you know, I'm feeling gloomy, dark, um, very, very energy deprived, but, you know, I'm going along with it and this is pretty exciting. And there's people from around the world. There's people from Japan and South Africa and ends up being 10 of us, staff of 14. The ratio was still good. There wasn't <laughs> anything you could ask for that didn't come immediately. And they were anticipating anything you wanted. So we get on this cruise and we head out to the Galapagos and I won't bother you with which islands, but you know, there, there are about eight or 10. We did the Southern route for those of you going toward Floriana first. If those of you who know the Galapagos and you can't do them all in, in eight days, you can only do Southern half, Northern half. It's all fantastic. We start doing this cruise, a lot of cool people. I'm generally not mixing very much. I'm not feeling very social. Um, but it's great to have my son there, my older son. At the time, he was 25. Is that right? 25? He's 28 now. And um, yeah, we go, we go through the motions and um, days are good. Hikes are good. It's really pretty spectacular. Uh, it's one of those things. Sa save up your nickels, dimes, quarters, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever you do. It is one of the trips in our lifetime worth doing. It's an extraordinary experience to visit Na untouched nature because man and woman hasn't screwed it up. Mm. Unbelievable to see what's possible as intended by creator when nothing messes it up. And this goes on, it's a seven, eight day cruise and I am not feeling much better. I didn't go there to feel better. I be went there to be with my son and in a funny macabre kind of way, it was sort of like my last trip. Like, so what? My last trip, we can do this. On the day, on the fifth day, and I used to get up in the morning early since I now have this capacity to wake up early, unknown to me, like, I don't know where it's coming from. They had an espresso machine. And as I always do on the fifth day of this trip, I get up at 5.30 now, 5.45, it's getting better, which is what I used to do anyway, make my double espresso. And as I do every morning, go out to the bow of the boat. And the way these cruises work is, they sail by night between the islands, three to six hours. And during the day, you're at an island, you're kayaking, snorkeling, hiking, whatever. So we're still sailing at 545. And I'm always there alone. I don't smoke. So I'm just sitting there, you know, sipping coffee, strong breeze. We're going through ocean. And you can see islands distantly, but it's, it's ocean. There's a lot of water. There's nothing visible. No one's awake. Everybody else is sleeping. And... I have an experience that rocked my world. I'm very fortunate. I've had many experiences on the spectrum of good to catastrophic, <laughs> fun to not so much fun. This one was surreal. Just surreal is all I can say. I had been taking notes every day, journaling, and sort of keeping track of my plight. The, the Louise plight and wow, how sad, how did I end up here after a life that I've lived? Decades and here I am on the bow, not feeling connected. And I had an encounter with what was the angel of death. And it, I, 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 I can't tell you I saw it, I heard it, I felt it, it, it was present and it was perfectly clear. And what I was told, and it was, now I forgot to mention this Nicole at dinner, it was in Spanish. Oh, really? Very important. It was in Spanish because I spoke Spanish till I was six and learned English when I went to first grade. Mm. And some of my dearest, most fundamental memories, dreams, uh, beliefs are in Spanish. They're encoded in my whole world in Spanish. And in Spanish, I was told, Luis, your time has come. Dive on in. You're done. You're finished. I own your kids. I own your things. I own your money. None of this world that you think you think you built, that you think you made happen, none of it's yours. It's mine and you're mine. 
And it's time you just dive in right now. Get over with it. No one's going to see you. They're not going to know. Your son won't know. Everybody will understand. You just gave up. And I was shocked. I, I, to say I was shocked is, is an understatement. In fact, I was trembling. I dropped my cup of coffee. I thought I, I must be now hallucinating. But I, I was hearing this. I was understanding it. And it made sense in terms of everything I'd been through. It made sense. And I was paralyzed. Now, I'm going to come back in just a few moments and tell you what happens next. And I'm here. Yeah. So. Now, were you when you were before his voice came in and was it like a masculine voice for you? Not overly masculine, but it was masculine. Yeah. OK. And were you thinking about anything specific right before you heard him start speaking to you? Well, you know, I went back and looked at my notes. I kept notes. I, every morning I was recapping how I felt, what I thought, um, memories, uh, areas of grief and sadness, kind of reviewing what I'd done every day. Mind you, I don't think I was doing anything special that morning. There was nothing special about that exact moment, weather-wise or anything else that I can recall. Yeah. Okay. So you dropped your coffee. Oh, clearly this struck you. It wasn't just a fleeting thought. It was no. very palpable. It was palpable. And I had been begging for relief back home uh, in any form I could get it. Mm -hmm. And when you're this depressed, all, I don't have to articulate what kind of relief we look for. Okay. I've been articulating for an end to it all so often and, and had taken measures that might've led there. And I wasn't doing that here, but the most amazing thing is I got angry. I'm hearing this going, what? Like one thing is for me to talk about what I'm going to do about me, but you're telling me what, what exact, I mean, you were telling me this is all over. I'm finished. I have, I have no way to, to affect this outcome. Now I got extremely angry, which in retrospect, not then I was not aware of it. That surprises me because I thought I would have just folded it and said, you're right. I'm diving off the hole. Thank goodness. I got a, Thank goodness. Someone supporting my vision that I've been asking for, but I didn't do that. I got extremely pissed off. That's really interesting. It almost makes you wonder if in some way the depression was your choice. And as soon as it wasn't your choice anymore, it's like it snapped you. Yeah. Well, um, I'll come back and share a few insights of, and you can help me, Nicole, and others will have other insights about what might've been going on. Um, one thing is for sure is there was a huge I in all of this. This is the essence of my malady, I. Mm. Mm. There was an enormous I going on and I was being tested how resolute I was to remain in the I view of the world, that I had to fix things, that I had to dictate, that I had to set the course and that I could end it right now. That's been one of the massive learnings is it was the ultimate test to say, uh, Dear Luis, who thinks he controls and manages and manifests everything himself, let's see if you can pull off the ultimate I move. Mm. In many ways, really push me. So let me share with you how I got here, how I got to that very moment, and then we'll move forward. First off, uh, you know, I, I live in Boulder, Colorado, and have lived here, at the time I lived here, less than 20 years, more like 18 years, born in DC, educated in California. I am the son of Guatemalan immigrants, classic American story of leaving the country you love and they love Guatemala to establish a path for growth and education and perhaps a better life for their children. And in many ways, I personified all of my father's angst and my mother's angst and hope and dreams. And I had lived a life of achievement. If, if you wanted to see achievement, 
uh, you would find achievement in my path as a way to uh, live. And so I'm living in um, Boulder, Colorado, and my father died in October of 2016. I'm talking to you right here about April 2019. So you're going to figure out really soon there's 26 months in between. That's just a lot of days, right? That's over 850 days that I'm about to go into deep depression. But my father dies October 15th. Mind you, for me, I was very unaccustomed to accepting or seeing spiritual messages at the time. In October 2016, I was beginning to be spiritually tuned in, but I was not very deeply there. And to give you an idea of, of what can happen maybe for you, has happened for you, I became later on more aware of what it was, was the day my father died, October 15th was a Saturday. Um, I, I answered the, I was laying in bed and my brother called me, my younger brother from Delaware and said, hey, Luis, why did you butt dial us? How did you know? And I said, butt dial you? I didn't butt dial you. I'm sleeping. I mean, I was literally sleeping three, he, two hours ahead in Delaware. He goes, no, you butt dialed me. We're in the ambulance right now. You called me with dad. He's dying. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. I didn't butt dial you. Cut it out. You're, this is a joke. He said, no, I'm telling you, I can show you. You called us. How could you have known we're even doing this? I said, I don't know. And I, and I didn't pay much attention to it. I literally was like, oh, what else? Freak, freaky, whatever. And I went ahead. I hiked that day. My father died while I was hiking. So while I'm hiking, dad dies at the hospital. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. So you have this conversation with your brother. They tell you they're in the ambulance. Your dad's not well. And you're, you're still choosing to go on a hike. Yeah. Oh, I, this is who I was. I, I had, I, I keep my commitments. I had a hike. I had a 10 a.m. Wow. Can we, can we just and, touch on that for a second? Cause yeah. I think that's really important. So you were super committed to your success or the whatever define what defined success for you back then? I would say, um, number one, providing for sons and their mother, because we were divorced then, um, being highest possible performance for others in work, friendship, sons, and in a, in a very strange way, a very Western definition of it in terms of metrics, in terms of he's the guy who always shows up. He's always there for us. Or, you know, he earns the most or he gets all the medals and he takes on the hardest challenges. It's, it's almost tacky. It was almost tacky. But that was my dogma was I can do it. I will do it. I will push myself harder every possible day. There is no reason not to do that. So you committed to yourself that you were taking a hike and you weren't going to say no to to the eye, to the eye and to a friend. I had committed to her. We're hiking. We're going to go for a hike. Okay. And, All right. And, go hike. and and furthermore, I'm so far away. What am I going to do? He's in Delaware. I did ask him, you know, should I come out and just wait and see what happens? I said, well, great. Call me. And, 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 and you can imagine later on the grief when I see 10 messages that hit my phone while I was hiking, but there was no receptivity until I got off the mountain and I realized my brother and my mother had been trying to call me as my dad expired mm -hmm. and I never caught it. I was hiking. So come back after the hike and I realized, oh my goodness, dad, dad died. And, and we're good, we're really good. He was 88, solid relationship, all's been spoken. I didn't grieve it much. This is one of the learnings. I didn't grieve it much at all. I, I was like, well, gosh, I'm going to have to plan the funeral. I want to be very active in the funeral. I got to start writing my speech, you know, really pragmatic shit. I'm not feeling how serious this is in my life. And this all goes on. I do go out for that funeral. We do have great family time in Delaware. Uh, and I return. And about a month after my father's death on November 18th, and this is sort of, you know, interesting incident number two, you could say it was a spiritually sent, it was created, creator giving me information I didn't know how to process. Um, I am in my home 
making dinner for a friend. And that evening, I feel literally as if there is like a wave, a breeze goes through my home, like a breeze. Mm -hmm. And as it hits me, I feel the most outrageous anxiety I have ever felt. Like the anxiety was, it was almost like this was the breeze of anxiety. It hits me. And within two weeks, I can't get out of bed. I mean, this is the beginning of this incredible collapse where by day I'm anxious, which as we know from the science, anxious is really being fearful of the future and thinking worst case of the future. And I get depressed, which is replaying the past, regretting the past, reprocessing it, look forward or backward. I'm clearly not in the present. Mm -hmm. I'm in the future. I'm in the past and I am suffering. And it starts in December. And it gets worse and worse. There was no Christmas for me. My sons lived with me at the time. Um, At the time, it was right before they moved out. And so one was 25, one was 21. And they were terrified. They'd never seen me so unwell. But they just thought, you know, we'll hang in here. Surely by New Year's and the week after, he'll be perfectly fine. Well, as I've said to you, this didn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. And I, I continued to come up with schemes and ways to make myself better. The first thing I did is I enrolled myself in a course in miracles intensive in Boulder. And there's many of those yep. and to go really deep into having the course in miracles cure me and help, help it cure me and help me cure me. And, um, it variously was effective, ineffective, good, bad, God knows. It was very complex. I don't know for those of you who've done course in miracles, it's pretty heavy. It, it's I, heavy. I, I have the book and it is oh, very, oh my God, it's heavy. Exactly. Interestingly enough, I came across the book when I was in my, my one and only phase of depression. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is though, this is good information for me later. I found it too cerebral because what I didn't know is I was being pushed to discover my heart in all of this. I had no idea. And I kept thinking, this isn't helping me because this is putting me back into my prodigious head which is where I've been living and how I've been guiding my life is through my head. I've actually been feeling through my head. I would intellectualize my feelings, not even feel them. So I'm like, no, this isn't working. And as the year go by, I end up at a depression clinic in Costa Rica for weeks to see if they will solve my issues. I, I pick them and I keep trying all kinds of modalities and the months and the quarters go by and there's no relief. Eventually my mother died a year later Oh, by the way, hello. First, I mentioned to you my father, the supposed butt dial that leads to my brother calling from the ambulance. And therefore, I'm actually being told, Luis, your spirit family father is making a transition. You know this. And it wasn't so much what I should do. It it was a connection. It was a clear connection. I've always been super connected to him, to his mother, my abuelita, Marta, to my older son, Sebastian, in particular. And when my mother, and so my mother, a year and a few months later, passed away, she called me on December 1st and said, you know, Luis, I want to see you. I need to see you. And I was like, mom, I I haven't seen you since dad's funeral over a year, but how coincidental. I have a consulting project in Philadelphia on the 5th of December. And she said, you will come see me, won't you? I'm like, I've just told you, I'm in Philadelphia the 5th. On the 6th, I'll come down to Wilmington and see you. And she called every day to say, you know, Luis, I'm so excited you're coming. You are coming, right? I was like, mom, I already told you, I'm coming. So she was 91. Um, And of course, I do my consulting project. The next day I go down, I bring her a little Chinese soup, egg roll, and I go visit her at the nursing home. And literally, Carol the uh, orderly that took care of her said, oh my God, I'm so happy you're here. She's been asking me all morning, are you coming? Have you arrived yet? And I'm like, oh my God, mom's really exigent. I mean, she's really being a little pushy around here, but okay, I'm here. And we had lunch, she was not well, she was in pain. And um, what a beautiful moment because um, I spent an hour with her and we talked and we touched, we held hands. And that afternoon I went to go watch a basketball game, my, my brother's son's game, Stefan's game took them to dinner nearby in the middle of dinner, Kara called to say, your mother died. Mm -hmm. We went and it was just, it was very disturbing because she was still in her bed 
right where I'd left her. So I felt very blessed to have had a moment with her, had moments and time. And she was so sweet, she waited for me, that she waited for me and she begged me to come because I was so far away. My brothers lived nearby and I wasn't. And I returned home. And in all of this, I wasn't listening very much. I wasn't listening. I wasn't receiving all this information. Mm -hmm. Then I went back to figure out what else could I do to make me better since I'd muscled my way through life and work harder, work faster relationships deals. And um, all of this takes me all the way to the Galapagos and the ship Arroyo that we were on because I wasn't any better. A year and a half later, here I am now in April of 2019 and I, I had exhausted my means to make this better. And that's where the lessons began. I mean, the lessons really began there because when I got angry, super pissed off, angry, furious at the angel of death, I just started screaming. I just started screaming and cursing. And what I screamed and cursed was, I won't do this because I finally get it. I surrender. I'm not going with you. I don't know what I'm doing but I'm not going with you. I give up, I surrender, I submit. There's gotta be a better answer I don't know about. Mm -hmm. And I am open to it. And when you look at surrender as a definition, it literally means to let go of your will, let shed your will, stop embracing your will and submit to the power of a higher authority or any other authority. And here, I had heard that word so many times. I said that word, but I never meant it. It was in my head. The entire two and a half years, I intellectualized it. It was never in my soul, in my heart. I never really did it or felt it ever until that moment. And the angel of death went away. And I was perfectly well two days later. It started right then. And... This entire shift in my life began in moving from I, me, my ego, to I will follow. I'm a servant. I, I'm done. I'm done with all the agendas, all the plans, all the strategies, all the stuff I've done that did work. I broke a lot of stuff, messed up a lot of stuff, but by and large, it was good. I'm done with the I. I, I will, I am, I has been replaced by oneness. I belong as part of oneness. Instead of forcing, so instead of I, one. Instead of force, I'm going with flow. I've mm. got it. I'm just going to go. I'm going to begin to trust. There are answers I don't know about and that will work out just fine. I'm just going to trust. From traditional leader, I've been a very good traditional leader, caring for my people on behalf of the company, caring for customers on behalf of the company switching to a servant leader where I really care about the people. It, it isn't the company. It was more around, I will do all I can to serve clients or people. For them, what comes and happens after that is whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to worry about achieving profit or fame. Um, from, and I'd had, this, I'd had this vision of myself of being almost a pirate in life, a lone pirate. Not only do I do it alone, I'm stealthy, I'm faster that way. Like American sniper, one bullet in the chamber, I will take them down. From that to spirit family, no more. I'm Put it away, I'm not doing this solo cowboy thing anymore. I'm going to connect with my spirit family, my grandmother, my ancestors, my father and mother, my sons, my community. And overall, from I perfected separation. All of this, this disease, by the way, mm. was separation. Yeah. This was the ultimate pain 
of, of the separation I had perfected in over decades. I was great at it. This was the ultimate payment and pain of separation. So moving from separation to unity. And I never had even heard the phrase ego death until I read up how I might understand, how I might understand what happened. My ego was incinerated. <laughs> there was no trace of the former Luis. When I came out of this two days later, even my memory was very vague. I knew one thing, I, I, I don't need to worry about it. I won't be who I was. I don't even know who that is. Mm -hmm. It's gone, I, that Luis is gone. Mm -hmm. I, I want to serve, I want to embrace, I want to believe, I want to trust. So, um, this is, well, this becomes a very integral part of your mission and how you work with your clients moving forward now, because, you know, one of the things that is, was made very clear to me last week when we were working together is how important the answer is when it comes from within you versus someone else telling you or showing you it doesn't have the same power. It doesn't have the same clarity. It right. just, it's there, but you don't get to actually become the solution. You don't feel the solution within you. That certainty or that just unmistakable, unshakable knowing of that truth only truly comes in the moment that it is revealed from within you to you. And it has the power, like you said, to in one moment incinerate everything that has held you back from that awareness until this point. Massively so, Nicole. And for me, one way I finally have come to understand it, and there's a balance here, but it's to acknowledge and embrace the heart and my heart as an instrument of living. So walk 18, 20 inches down and to the left across my chest. And instead of thinking my way to everything, it's feeling and intuiting much more. That was so brand new to me. I, I hadn't done any of that. I, I probably tasted it some, but that's not how I lived. Mm -hmm. And instead it became how to make decisions, how to serve people, um, how to design from the heart. And it wasn't long after I came home, it was in May and June of, of 2019, that full expression came about because I, one of the major takeaways I had was my goodness, here all this time, there is another form or version of me within me that can help this planet and other people so much more than how I'd been doing it, truly so much more, and that will help them those people be joyous and happy and return it to their family, their communities. It was a epiphany, but one that my heart embraced and said, this is your work. You can be a consultant, venture investor, buyout investor, CEO and give speeches, and you can do some of that, but this work is the work you should do going forward. And it's a lot of the work that I do do going forward. And and I approach it with as little ego as I can. I, I try to watch that because it's not about what am I doing? I'm guiding. We don't transform. We don't coach. We don't tell anybody what to do. We are guiding our clients to tap the best in themselves in the best way they can. And, um, and, to, and to listen to the signals. The signals I never listened to. Listen to these signals. Receive these signals. However scary they are, unfamiliar, unwanted, listen. And, and the important thing about receiving is you need to receive with your heart. The heart and has to be open. Yeah. And, and that, so this has, um, you know, fast forward. Here we are a little more than three years after that moment. I, I don't know how we measure things in terms of life and people say, this was the best year of my life. This was the best dinner, the best party. I do know this, 
I've experienced unusual joy and happiness and fulfillment and gratitude the last three years by living through my heart much more than just my head. And that's combined. And as a result of living through my heart, giving myself permission to wander, permission to explore, permission to do nothing. My, as, as Nicole knows, my meta mantra for myself is um, less doing, more being. Just four words, less doing, come up, more being. Just and continue to do that. And the more I just be, even if it looks like I'm doing nothing, I am where I should be. I am, do, I, am, I am what I should be because it helps me be more impactful uh, for others, um, not just my family, but clients, community, the world, and, and to trust that by being, I will get the answers and implement them, which I did not trust before. I had limited trust, limited listening, very much in the head, not much in the heart, not much in the intuition. And I am just so grateful that the work we do at Full Expression is for other very impactful, high level, whatever executive and leaders who like me may have a third act, other acts, other chapters to pay attention to and probably do where they can also make a bigger difference and have joy. And that, that's, um, that's what I'm dedicated to. Well, I sense from my own perception of when I look out into the world and all the different places um, and industries and relationships that this human civilization is going through a heart activation and that many hearts are coming online, whereas before they were offline. Mm. And of course, when something is offline, it's not connected. It's not connected to all of the potential and the possibilities that would come through the connection with others and connection to greater intelligence that we can't define in our own words down here. It's just impossible. But also when you talked about even just delivering your story and how everything comes about, it is not in a linear path. No. And that is something that I have discovered is so integral when, especially when you're working with the heart is to embrace aspects and knowing that you will be on the pathless path at varying points within your own journey. And that doesn't mean that there aren't certain goals and there aren't certain strategies that you may be having along the way, but to know that at any given moment, you have to be ready to maybe Re redefine them, drop them, restructure, or completely surrender because there's so much that opens up that is not possible for us to conceive when we're not fully, well, let's just say this for you. You recognize that the only way you were able to find yourself was first by being lost. Only when we are lost, are we able to truly find ourselves? And that is actually the good thing and the bad thing about the pathless path and the journey that many of us are going through. Mm -hmm. And we struggle with being lost because it doesn't feel safe. It doesn't feel uh, like it's the direction that everyone else promotes. And of course there's no certainty there. And we as humans need to know where we are at all times, where we're going, where we're ending up. And the pathless path takes all of that away from you, but it does leave you with the potential for anything and everything. Yeah. It was um, the allure of A Course in Miracles is the capstone idea of the holy instant, mm -hmm. whereby one's perception and therefore one's state of being can change instantly, not in months, not in years, instantly. Like you would say, well, how is that possible? And this is why I say that time is curvy linear. It's not linear. It's not a literal journey that things can happen in an instant on the bow of a boat when we surrender and reject the angel of death. And it felt like it took, I felt like I was there days and it was only a few minutes, mm -hmm. but it happened. It happened at that moment. 
and 26 months were cured in 48 hours. No, no doctor would ever have told me that was possible. In fact, it wasn't. They are recommending more meds, different meds. The answer was medicate more, numb mm-hmm. more. And the answer lie in a three or four minute experience. So that's taught me so much about listening, receiving with the heart, learning. One of the things I often ask people to do is to permit me to change my mind completely when I learn things. Sorry, I I never used to do that. I wanted to be so consistent. I told you I would do this. I'll do it no matter what, even in the face of contrary evidence. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, hey, pardon me, but I'm allowed to learn and change my mind because I just got some new inputs. I wouldn't necessarily call them spiritual downloads, but I have new insights, new information. I just met some new people. I've changed my mind. I'm not doing that now. And it feels much better not to do it because I'm operating from my heart and intuition as opposed to the logic of you know, the formula of this is right or that's not right or this is wrong and that's not wrong. Um, and, and therefore, um, I encourage, I encourage however painful it may be is to stay in the liminal state. If you find yourself uncomfortable in a time of big change, it may be a moment of liminality where nothing makes sense, nothing's very clear, where you're not as comfortable or sure of what's next as you're accustomed to being, which was certainly my life. Mm-hmm. And my learning is that that's where the gold is, right there. In that liminal state is where you have a chance to evolve forward or in any direction toward your next happy state. I think that surrender is such an important word, but also feeling to embrace and truly connect with and understand at a deeper level for people to have the experience that you've described, that experience of the answer completely revealing itself to you in an instant. The truth was right there and it came to you so quickly. It wasn't something that took months, although the journey may have been months, but the answer revealed itself in an instant. And surrender is something that is so counterintuitive to our culture and to our society, because we perceive it as weak. We perceive it as giving up and it is anything but those. And so we, we confuse them Going off based off my own personal journey that I've just gone on over the last 10 days, two weeks, surrender was something I had to absolutely embrace, Mm -hmm. knowing that if I wanted to, if I wanted to experience the full expression of the experience and to receive everything that I was able to receive, I had to get out of my own way. Mm -hmm. I had to absolutely surrender. And I had to have moment, like, little sayings that I would remind myself with, like, you're here to embrace it. It's okay. You can let go. You don't have to hold on anymore. You're going to be caught. And I think that's one of the biggest fears is that if we let go, where will we land? Right. Who's here? Yeah. Who's got the old trust fall? Is there, is there somebody really behind me? And if I just fall, am I going to hit the ground or is someone going to catch me? Absolutely. With your clients, and what your, your work is now today, where have you experienced the deepest shifts and where have you also seen where people struggle um, to experience what it is perhaps maybe their, their heart is saying, I want to experience this, but maybe the mind's not allowing it. So where are you seeing, like when you put the polarization of the, 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 the doors being blown wide open and still hitting the wall? We, we have amazingly powerful human software called the ego. There's some other names for it. It's so powerful and far from being evil, the ego tries to protect us from many harmful situations or things that we have deemed harmful and too painful to relive and deal with. And we're able to compartmentalize them and put them away. What I have learned is that 
exponential growth, not just small growth. Exponential growth usually is impeded by a few events and barriers and walls we've created to protect ourselves. And they are so significant in our psyche, in our ego, we can't even see them. They're right in front. It's, it's like walking into a room, leaving and never realizing what the wallpaper was. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, we, walked absolutely right. room, we walked in the room so many times, someone said, what's that wallpaper? You go, what wallpaper? The wallpaper in your bedroom that you've had 10 years, you're like, there's no wallpaper there. Mm-hmm. You can't even see it anymore. It's already, it's, it's in the music, it's in the smell. The work to be done is in achieving altered state of consciousness. And it can be done with an array of tools from holotropic breathing and aqua water rebirth to um, certain types of exercises, to plant medicines, to quests and journeys. But it's to achieve altered state of consciousness where we now can see the wallpaper. Mm -hmm. The wallpaper is so clear. And when you see the wallpaper, you realize, oh my goodness, I've been terrified all my life of the little images and the monsters in the wallpaper. No wonder I don't look at it. It scares the living daylights out of me. Like, why would I want to see the wallpaper as a metaphor? Once our clients see the wallpaper and begin to move it, tear it off, literally tear it off the wall, they're able to repaint that room, redesign it, and live a very, very different life. It's like those um, pictures where it's so abstract and you can't actually see it until all of a sudden it pops out and then you can't ever unsee it. It's always there. And it's amazing how our minds work to hide things in plain sight. Absolutely. I love that phrase. I do think that is where it's hiding right in front of you. A few phrases that come to mind is by and large, our greatest strengths are our greatest weaknesses. So one area to look at is what are the things we deem the strongest? What are they covering up? Because there's some information there. There's some real wisdom there in terms of your strengths being your weaknesses. Uh, For sure, um, anything that we're highly judgmental of in others, Some great secrets there. If we're highly judgmental in others, we're protecting ourselves. Mm-hmm. There's something we're protecting about us, about how we view ourselves that might benefit from attention and, and yeah. so forth. And so forth. I think that's important. You know, with working with you, I realize, you know, many people would say one of my, and I would say this too, one of my greatest strengths is that I know how to do a lot of things. I know how to I don't need a lot of assistance. I'll just figure it all out and I'll, I'll do it by myself. But it's also one of my greatest weaknesses is I'll do it by myself when I would benefit from actually having others help me and I don't need to do it all alone. And so you're absolutely right. So in our strengths, we can also find the weaknesses that are holding us back. And I think that's very valuable information for anyone to look. It's a really big clue. And knowing that you actually don't have to look that deep. <laughs> it's right there in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd also say um, the full expression clients who are having to work longer and much harder to realize their greatest self, generally we're unwilling to stay in the liminal, the mushy liminal, scary unknown state. They're the ones who wanted just to stop that quickly. I I want out of here. It's too uncomfortable. I'm too terrified of who I'm going to be, will be, might be, if I just let go now and just keep floating in this this state of evolution. Those clients who either didn't want to go there or got out too early end up having to revisit and do it again and again. So that's my other bit of advice is that with with certain support, be aware it's perfectly fine to feel completely lost. That is a great place to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's because the, there's a lot of processing that has to come through all absolutely. of that. Absolutely. 
Like even myself, I uh, yesterday I was completely exhausted. I had all these things that I wanted to get done for the day. And I realized I can't, I have to, I have to rest. I have to just let go because there's two, my, I, my body, my heart, my mind, everything's just processing whatever was just blown open. And I have to surrender to that. I have to allow that to take precedence right now, because like you said, if I don't, I'm going to be returning to it later and it's going to be less enjoyable <laughs> way less pleasant, and it's way less pleasant it may take longer and even be more painful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. beautiful well i'm so glad that i've met you you've become such a great friend and i've learned so much uh through your experience and your friendship your heart and i know the audience is just loving your experience and your presence and the energy that you've been bringing mm -hmm. to close out the show I would like you to perhaps revisit the moment with your mom. Mm -hmm. And what do you think she would like to say right now to all of us? I think she would say, I needed to see all three of them, me and my brothers, before I was ready to go to my next world. That's really what it was. She, she had my brothers around and she was just determined, having been an awesome mother, she's created us, guided us. She needed to get the business done the right way at the expense of great pain and discomfort. And that speaks to the importance of our connections and our relationships and how valuable they are. Yeah. And that they should never be put yeah. low on the priority list. I think it's so important when we nurture our connection with ourself or in our relationships that I think is when our world starts to shift into a completely different paradigm than where we've been living. So beautiful message. Thank you. And to the audience, if you're interested in working with Luis or you want to check out his work, I'm leaving all of his uh, connection points in the show notes below. And guys, I love you so much. Have a wonderful week. And of course, I will be back with you next time. Thanks again for joining me for another show on the Enlighten Up podcast. I love you guys so much for all of your continued support. So remember to raise your vibe, find your tribe and be open to the infinite possibilities held in the mysteries that surround us all. Thanks again for sharing the show with your family and friends. And if you're new to the show and you need to find out more information about me, please head on over to my website, NicoleFrolic.com, where you can join my newsletter. And please follow me on Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube. Keep your light bright and I'll see you next week.